Hello everybody, welcome to Snyder's Inc. 2.0. We have a new one for you. I'm just going to call Snyder's Inc. still in the yeah, open, but it's 2.0. Uh, you'll know that by looking at the channel name. Uh, we got a new video for you. We got another new reaction video for you. I said we're getting right into it, and I ain't going to react to anybody right at the beginning, other than my boy Mr. Bowen. However, if you have any paranormal, true crime, uh, Pacific Mr. Ballin ones, or any music reaction videos you would like me to react to, let me know in the comment section. I will read the, them and probably do them all if I can fit them in. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna get right into this though. Hope you're all ready for it. Let's get right into this. This is top three places you can't go and people who shut you up. People who went anyways. Part eight. You guys ready for this? Of course, you're ready for this. Let's go. Today's stories are more anxiety inducing than normal, so viewer discretion is advised. But before. Oh god, I have anxiety, so that's gonna drive my brain crazy. Oh god, oh god, oh god. Before we get into today's. Oh, just get those out there. Sorry. Um. If you're going to subscribe to the channel and that, uh, please also follow me on my Twitter. My Twitter is uh, not the link to it, but the um, at thing to follow me on Twitter is in the description below. Please follow me on that. That way uh, you get updated to when I'm going to release videos and you can also suggest things for me. Because uh, at the moment, uh, when I lost the last one, I couldn't get in touch. I couldn't let anybody know. So please follow me on Twitter. So in case that happens, like, so hopefully, even though I hope it doesn't happen again, if something does happen, I can let you know. Please follow me on Twitter, please. Stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do, and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer to give the like button a ride home, and as soon as they get in the car, immediately start chain-smoking cigarettes with the windows up and blare techno music at full blast, and then drop them off for you. <laughs> I always love the fact that he laughs while doing it. Sorry, I'm kind of just thinking I had to let people know. So anyone who saw this, I'm hoping they see it. Um. Anyways, let's get right back into this. Sorry, I, but I do enjoy the fact he laughs. It's more genuine. I can't even do it. Blair techno music at full blast and then drop them off 40 miles away from their home. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. On April 28, 2000, a 24-year-old named Yuri Lipsky was standing in front of a cafe in Dahab, Egypt, overlooking the Red Sea. He had traveled all the way to the Sinai Peninsula from Moscow in order to film himself swimming through the arch. But now, damn, that's long ass. A little trip there. Just saying. Now it was looking like that probably wasn't going to happen. The arch is an 85 foot long underwater tunnel that connects a massive sinkhole right on Dahab shoreline called the Blue Hole to the Red Sea. To get to the arch, you need to enter the Blue Hole directly and descend straight down 181 feet where you'll reach the top of the tunnel on the northeast side. But there's a catch. If on your descent you happen to miss the ceiling of this arch, which apparently it's pretty easy to do, you run the risk of going too deep. Now, going too deep does not mean you're going to miss the tunnel altogether. The arch actually starts at 181 feet, but then goes all the way down to 393 feet. So it's a huge, huge opening. The risk of going too deep has to do with how your body responds to the type of gas you're breathing. For those who are unfamiliar with diving, generally speaking, you have two types of dives. There's recreational diving, where you breathe the same air that you breathe on the surface. They literally jam air directly into scuba bottles. You breathe that and you go down to 130 feet. That's the recommended bottom depth that you would go down breathing regular air. And then there is technical diving, where you breathe a special mixture of gases. Typically, it's gonna be a mixture of helium, nitrogen, and oxygen that allow you to go below 130 feet. This type of diving is exponentially more dangerous and requires all sorts of additional training. 
Because the minimum depth you would need to go to in order to access the arch is 181 feet, that puts you well in the technical diving range, which means you should be diving mixed gas and have special training and equipment. But year after... I'm gonna guess people don't do that when having this... when doing this. For a year, people try to dive down to the arch and go through it on regular air. And year after year, people die doing it. When that's stupid. Don't do that. That's stupid. If you know, if you're at risk of dying, you need certain training. Just get the goddamn training, you dumb shits. When your body absorbs too much nitrogen, you can get something called nitrogen narcosis, which is a lot like being drunk. And in extreme cases, divers who get this have been known to remove their mouthpiece and inhale water, believing they are actually on the surface. Below 130 feet, your body absorbs nitrogen much faster, and regular air is a whopping 78% nitrogen. So the risk of getting nitrogen narcosis is exponentially higher if you're breathing regular air below 130 feet. Also, oxygen can become toxic the deeper you go in the water column. It can lead to blackouts and convulsions that if you don't have someone there to literally physically move you up in the water column, you won't recover from it and you'll die. Regular air contains 21% oxygen, which is a lot of oxygen. Yes. So if you're diving regular air below 130 feet, you are at an increased risk of developing O2 toxicity. Now, to be clear, it is possible on regular air to dive down to 181 feet and make it through the arch and come out the other side and be just fine. But you're realistically at 181 feet pushing the absolute boundary of what you can get away with on regular air. Below 200 feet, you're probably dead. So if you're attempting to swim through the arch on regular air, you need to be paying very close attention to your depth as you descend so that you don't miss the arch and accidentally drift down below 181 feet to the very deadly 200 feet and beyond. So earlier in the day, Yuri had gone... Oh, did Yuri get trapped? Did Yuri end up going beyond and missing that arch and going beyond that point? Oh no. Eric, why? Down to the edge of the blue hole, and he had found one of the diving instructors that taught inside the blue hole. His name was Tarek Omar, and he asked him if he'd be willing to take him down to the arch to help him film himself going through the arch. And Tarek said, yes, but I need to train you for two weeks before you're going to be considered qualified to do that and you need a special setup with a special gas mixture to do this dive. And Yuri was like, well, I'm leaving in two days to head back to Moscow, so I need to do this dive now. Is, is there any way you can do it today or tomorrow even? And Tarek was like, no, that's not how this works. And Tarek understood this more than anybody else, because in addition to teaching diving at the Blue Hole, Tarek's job was to dive down to the bottom and retrieve the dead bodies of inexperienced Imagine that being your job. You gotta go retrieve the dead bodies of the people who try this and fail. What are we? Oh my god, that's gotta be a very uncomfortable job to have. Oh man. I don't like that job would give me. Oh. Ah. Ah. Anxiety is going nuts right now. Ah or overconfident divers that attempted the archway and didn't make it. Although there is not an official body count of how many people have perished inside of the Blue Hole, locals believe it's as high as 200 people just in the last decade. After what? Tarek was unwilling to take him without properly training him and outfitting him with the right equipment, Yuri thanked him and went on to a couple different other diving instructors with the same request. Will you take me in the next couple of days? And they all said, no, we need to train you and you need special equipment. And so finally, after no one was willing to do this, Yuri just left. Later that day, owners of cafes that overlooked the Blue Hole remember seeing a young man who was by himself walk to the edge of the Blue Hole. He puts on all of his scuba gear. He puts on a helmet and then straps a big camera to the top and ratchets it down. And then after he's got all his stuff on, he jumps into the Blue Hole and he did Yuri did it on his own accord despite the fact not having training. I have a feeling that dude's gonna be retrieving his body. I just have a feeling that that's what's gonna happen. Disappears. That man was Yuri. A few days later, Yuri's family back home in Moscow did not see him get off the flight he was supposed to be on, and they reported him missing. Tarek Omar was contacted to go down into the blue hole and see if Yuri was down there. 
Tarek hopped in the blue hole, he went to the bottom, and sure enough, lying face down at the bottom was Yuri. When they brought Yuri to the surface, they realized his camera had been running the whole time, and he had actually filmed his final moments. Yuri's final video exists online, so you can watch it for yourself, but here is a description of what happens. After situating his camera on his head just the way he wanted it, he hit record, and then he jumped into the water. It was determined later on that Yuri was breathing regular air out of his tanks. The camera submerges under the water, and then Yuri begins to sink very quickly into the blue hole, but his breathing seems normal and he's not thrashing around, so it seems like it's a controlled descent. But at some point you hear Yuri trying to activate his buoyancy compensator. Basically it's this life jacket, to describe it simply, that sits on your gear that you have a demand valve where you can inflate and deflate the air into it to neutralize your buoyancy. Or in an emergency situation, you can fully inflate it and stop yourself from sinking. In fact, you'll rise to the surface. But he's trying to activate his buoyancy compensator to slow down his descent and the air is escaping his compensator. There's a leak and he can't slow down his descent. Now, Yuri was wearing a weight belt, which is very common in diving. In fact, I don't really know of all that many dives that you wouldn't use a weight belt. And any diver knows that there is a quick release function on your weight belt. Specifically, if you're in an uncontrolled descent or if you're in an emergency. What I bet is that he is panicking so much, he's gonna forget that part. He's gonna leave it and he's gonna end up going down. Um, I think I've seen his video before. I think I've seen his video, because I did a reaction video on my old channel to people who recorded their own deaths, and I think this one's on it. Emergency situation and need to get to the surface, you can jettison your weight belt and go to the surface. But Yuri was panicking and he was fixated on his buoyancy compensator that he was desperately trying to activate and it was failing, and so he's not going for his weight belt. And then he- Yeah, because he's panicking too much. Once you panic- Once you start panicking, your brain does not use the common- does not use common sense. It just go, focuses on the one thing that's causing you to panic. It's really bad. I hate it because I, when I have panic attacks, that's what my brain does. He rockets past the entrance to the arch. So he goes below 181 feet, he goes below 200 feet, and he goes all the way to the bottom where he hits the bottom at 392 feet. And then he begins to slide because the bottom of the blue hole was actually at an angle and that archway went all the way to the bottom of the hole. And if you slipped out of the blue hole, it was a sheer drop off for thousands of feet. And you see on camera, Yuri rolls over and he's desperately clawing into the mud to stop himself from sliding out of the blue hole to death definite death, and he's trying to get himself to stop, and finally he anchors himself in the dirt, and it's calm for a second, and he's kind of looking around, it's very clear he's confused, and then it goes still. And it's believed at this point he either removed his mouthpiece because of nitrogen narcosis, you know, he pulled it out and inhaled water, or he was dealing with O2 toxicity, and he blacked out, and the mouthpiece came out, but either way, he drowned. Hey, you! Me? Yeah, you! Don't you want to play something? So I guess for the fact that uh, I have ads playing, I have to make it YouTube Premium on this account now, just so you don't get ads. <sighs> Situated an hour's drive. Fucking YouTube. Drive from Johannesburg in South Africa lies Sturkfontein Cave. The cave is famous for the fossils that have been found there and also for its underground lake whose walls look like Swiss cheese. There's all these tunnels that spider all over the place. Many of them are unexplored and no one knows how deep the cave actually goes. In 1984, cave diver Peter Verhussel, along with two of his friends, decided they wanted to explore these passageways in the lake and specifically they wanted to check out a chamber called Milner Hall, which was fairly far down in the lake. There was a guideline that was anchored from the surface of the lake all the way down into the different sections that had been explored. And this was so cave divers could hold hold on to it and make their way through without getting lost. Not that I've ever been cave diving, but from what I've read, there is one golden rule. You never let go of the guideline. And if you do, it better be extremely well planned and you should do it with other divers present. Peter was a notorious risk taker and was the least experienced cave diver of the three. So, so he's gonna be the one that just lets it go willy nilly and is gonna end up losing control of it. 
When they entered the lake, they were all holding the guideline, and Peter was the third back. And so they began descending down into the lake. Oh no, absolutely make the inexperienced one the middle guy. Make him right in the middle. That way no doubt can come into your brain as to what's going down. Make sure he's not doing anything stupid, especially if he's a risk taker. Just let it be, have him be the middle guy. And at some point, Peter's curiosity got the better of him, and he left the line to go look at the wall where there was, you know, something he wanted to look at. And luckily, the other two divers noticed it, they saw him, and they swam over and got him and brought him back to the guideline. And even though you can't communicate underwater, I'm sure they looked at him like, come on, don't do that. And they kept going down, and then once again, Peter's curiosity gets the better of him. He leaves the guideline and goes over and checks something else out. The other two divers notice again, they turn around, they grab him, and they pull him back. And now they're looking at him like, you can't do this, no more. And so Peter's body language indicated that he got it, and he was back in the guideline, he's not going to do it again. And they continue down, and they're getting closer to Milner Hall, when the first two turn around to check on Peter, and he's gone. And now previously, when they found him those other two times when he left the guideline, he was just over right against the wall, and he was easy to spot. But this time, he wasn't. They're looking around with their lights, and he's nowhere to be found. Peter, why do you keep having to let go of the one thing you're not supposed to? I don't... Ah! <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> And they're not prepared to go leave into one of these tunnels to go looking for him because there were so many. It was like Swiss cheese down there with all these different tunnels he could have gone into and they didn't know which one he went in. And so after kind of waiting and looking around for a couple of minutes thinking maybe he'll come back, they were running out of air and they had to go to the surface. So the two men surface, they call the police, they explain what happened. Rescue divers are sent to the cave to go looking for Peter, but by the time they even got there, it had been several hours. It takes a while to mount this type of search and Peter only had one tank of air. And so if he hasn't surfaced by now, the thought is he's drowned at this point. But the rescue divers go into the lake, they head down to the area where Peter was last seen and they look around and and they can't find him and they surface pretty quickly and they say look we're just not prepared to look through all these different tunnels he could have gone in just to find his body because at this point there's no way he's alive he's been down here for hours he doesn't have enough air and one of us one of the rescue divers is going to get trapped in one of these tunnels and we don't want to lose anyone so we're terminating the search peter's friends are devastated and they say hey can you let us go down and look for peter's body for his family and the police said no we're banning diving in this case Wow, so they're not even gonna let them go find the body. They're like, nah, man, we're not letting you look and die for his, your friend's body. We're not doing it, no. I mean, right on police say, like, your life's not worth it. Trust me, just leave it. Six weeks after Peter went missing inside of this lake, a group of dry cavers were doing some work in a chamber that was right next to this underground lake. And they were chiseling this wall when all of a sudden the wall kind of collapsed, revealing another chamber on the other side of this wall. They took their flashlight out and they looked inside and it looked like a tunnel that kind of weaved around the corner. And they shined their light on the ground and it looked like there were some muddy or sandy footprints that were left as if someone had been walking right there. The cavers were initially terrified the idea that there's anything living behind the walls inside of a cave. But they stepped over and they walked around the corner and it revealed this huge air pocket that clearly was connected to the underground lake because there was water right in the middle of this air pocket and there was no other way in besides, you know, this wall that's collapsed. And in the middle of the water, there was this island. It was like this sandy, muddy, rocky island right in the middle of this air pocket. And laying on the island was Peter. In a stroke of luck, after Peter went missing from his dive, he had discovered this air pocket and he had surfaced and climbed onto this island. He knew he didn't have enough air in his air tank to get to the surface again. And so he figured, okay, I'll just sit on this island. There seems to be enough air in here for me. I'll wait. And Oh, so he was hoping people would come looking for him, but they refused to because they didn't know because the, the rescue people and any diver doesn't know about the air pocket. So to him, it's just, oh, he's most likely dead. Damn, man. Until my dive buddies invariably go get help and come down here and rescue me. He sat inside of that air pocket for three weeks waiting for a rescue that never arrived. Before he ultimately died of starvation, he wrote a message in the sand to his mother and to his wife telling them that he loved them. To this day, diving is still prohibited inside of Sturkfontein Cave. Good morning. A little sword practice while the...
day is young is good for the body and mind. If not me, then who? Well, I have a feeling I'm gonna want to scream at whoever's doing th uh, this one. A little after 1.30 in the morning on June 17th, 2017, 34 U.S. Navy sailors were asleep inside of birthing compartment number two on the USS Fitzgerald. Their birthing compartment was below the waterline, meaning where they were sleeping was underwater. They were sailing along through the South China Sea when all of a the sudden there is this explosion in the birthing compartment and a rush of cold air. The explosion was a 30,000 ton container ship crashing into them, gouging an opening in their wall bigger than a semi-truck. Before any of the 34 sailors could make sense of what was happening, tens of thousands of gallons of seawater are pouring into their compartment. The sailors were sleeping in what they called coffin lockers, which were these bunk beds where the bunks were stacked three high and the lowest bunk was practically on the ground. And so as soon as the water came pouring into the room, everybody who was sleeping on a lower bunk was immediately completely submerged in water and all the furniture inside of the space was lifted up by the rush of water and a few unlucky sailors who were in those bottom bunks were trapped by furniture that landed right in front of their bunk. The sailors immediately jumped into action, leaping out of their bunks, pulling people out of those lower bunks. Everybody's trying to help each other out to get to the exit, which was a ladder that led up to a hatch in the ceiling. The sailors inside of the space were very close with each other. Pretty much 24 hours a day, they were always within a few feet of each other. And so that explains why as the water was rising and rising, getting up to their necks, they formed an orderly line as they all made their way up this ladder through this hatch. As they waited in line to get out of the space, the water was getting so high that they were tilting their heads to barely be able to... These guys are trying to save each other if by any means necessary. They're making, they want so well, they want everyone to survive, man. Respect, respect. Read the space that was left inside of the room. And when the water is really cold, you involuntarily open your mouth. And so water was pouring into their mouths, making it very hard to breathe. As each man climbed the ladder and went through the hatch to relative safety, they would turn around and help the next guy up. And they remembered hearing this hissing sound, which was the sound of all the air being forced out of the compartment through this hatch as it filled with seawater. And then finally, the survivors that had made it out of the hatch were able to pull the last few guys that were in line to go up the ladder. They pulled them out and then they realize they're short eight sailors, but they're faced with this terrible th Oh, you can't, don't go save them guys, you won't be able to. You have to, no, you can't man, you can't. You have to stay on its own, you can't. Decision, because they need to shut the hatch and seal it. It's a procedure inside of a sinking ship to keep it from sinking. If they don't shut this compartment, they run the risk of killing more people on board the ship. And so they decide they're gonna wait for a couple of extra seconds and they begin yelling, come to the sound of my voice in hopes that anybody that's still down there could hear them through the water and would swim to them. And then before they shut it, they poked their head down and looked and they saw a glimmer of what looked like a man swimming away from the ladder. And they're thinking, why are they swimming away? Don't they know they need to come here? And they're yelling to this person, come back, come back, swim to our voice. And then moments later, this burly sailor from Arizona named John Mead came out of the darkness and clambered up the ladder and they pull him out and he's coughing and he's gagging and he said, Gary Ream saved me. I was behind a locker, he pulled me out. And it dawned on the two sailors that saw that man swimming away from the ladder farther into the compartment that they had tried to stop, that they had tried to, to get back to them, that wasn't John Meade, that was Gary Ream. He was intentionally swimming back to save these guys. But now, in a cruel twist of fate, they had to seal the hatch with Gary and six others still inside. At 37 years old, Gary- Gary probably wanted that. Gary probably saved that dude's life, understanding that he probably was risking his own. I guarantee you he was aware of that. Gary Ream was a veteran of the ship. He referred to the other sailors as his kids, and when they were on land, he would invite them over to his house for holiday meals. He was approaching 20 years of service and he was planning to retire soon and move back to Virginia with his family and become a fireman. Gary was asleep inside of birthing compartment number two when the crash happened. And instead of going up the ladder to safety, which he could have done, he was near the ladder, he instead decided to make multiple trips into the far back section of the compartment, which is where the most people were trapped by furniture, either in their bunks or in the bathroom stalls. And he went back over and over and over again, knowing full well that once this water reaches the ceiling, they are going to seal the hatch. He's been in the Navy almost 20 years. He knows the procedure. But Gary loved his kids and he was prepared to die for them. And on this day, he did. 19 of the 27 surviving sailors credit Gary for saving their life. So that's gonna do it, guys. If
Bravo to you, Gary, for risking your life to save the other men on that ship. At least as many as you could. Absolute respect to you, sir. That is why the do like that deserves all the respect in the world and should not be hated. That's why military and navy people should not be hated. And if you do hate them, how dare you? How dare you? But ladies and gentlemen, that is it for this reaction video. Hope y'all enjoyed it. First one on a new channel. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, comment what you think down below. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you for the next one.